talk on myopia management. We're going to be talking about new strategies to prevent myopia progression. I'm Dr. Sarah Grell, one of the primary eye care optometrists here at Hellerstein and Brenner. Um, we're a full scope optometric practice for those of you that don't know us in Greenwood Village. And on behalf of all of us at Heller Senior Brenner Vision Center, we want to thank you for spending your evening with us to learn a little bit about nearsightedness and different treatment options. All of the practicing optometrists here at Heller Senior Brenner are certified in the newest contact lens technology for myopia management, which you're going to hear more about in a moment. Um, I just wanted to take a second to acknowledge some of our staff that's also joined us, Dr. Hellerstein is here. Um, I think I saw Trina, our office manager. That's all I see right now. Um, and then we do encourage you to type any questions you may have during the talk in the chat section. And I'll try to help make sure that we see those and get those answered either during the lecture or at the end. Um, it is with great pleasure that I get to introduce our speakers for the evening. Dr. Alex Wiss is a graduate of Illinois College of Optometry. She specializes in pediatric vision care and is passionate about vision therapy and has a special, special interest in sports vision therapy. Um, Dr. Amy Elsala is a graduate of the University of Houston College of Optometry and she is passionate about working with children and specializes in working with patients who have suffered concussions and traumatic brain injuries. Um, so we're gonna get started. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Alex. Hello everyone. Again, thank you for joining us today. And please, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type them out and we'll get those answered for you because that's what we're here for is to support you and um, answer your questions that you have in regards to myopia management. All right, so this is us, some compete pictures of us, and everyone wouldn't mind muting so you guys can hear my lovely voice <laughs> as we go through. So we're going to start off with the basics here and really start looking at what is myopia. Um, we've heard that word a whole lot and the concerns regarding it. What it is, is the common term to use is nearsightedness, so the inability or the difficulty to see things at distance very clearly. Um, typically develops in childhood as we um, the eyes developing and growing and it's something that can continue to grow and we'll talk about the implications of that growth. Um, so overall what happens in an eyeball, really simple is we have the eye, we have light coming into that eye through the cornea and through the lens and the idea is that those light rays focus on the retina itself. Now what happens in something like myopia here in that middle picture is that the eyeball is theoretically longer or the cornea is more curved or too curved. And what happens when that light ray comes in, it doesn't stop and hit the retina. In fact, it stops before the retina, giving us a blurry image. So in order to correct for that, we need contacts or glasses in order to push that image back onto the retina. So again, blurred vision results from the light rays focusing in front of the retina rather directly on the surface. So if you aren't nearsighted or um, have not experienced being myopic, um, here's a little demonstration of what it might look like um, to someone when they're not wearing their correction. So that first one is what we consider mild myopia. So up to minus three diopters and di diopters, you'll hear us use that term throughout today's presentation. And that is what um, prescription is measured in like centimeters or something like that. Um, that middle one is moderate. So up to six diopters of myopia. And that last one is high or sometimes considered severe when you're greater than minus six diopters. So there's, again, just a diagram or a little graph here of what it could look like um, if you are not wearing your correction, that blurred image. So what causes myopia? And that's something that we'll focus on a whole lot here is what causes it and is there anything that we can do to prevent the progression of myopia? So two big factors that contribute to myopia development is genetics and lifestyle, both playing a significant role in how severe, how significant myopia may be. So first let's review genetics. So if we're looking at a child and both parents are myopic, there's a one in two chance that they will also have myopia. 
If only one parent is myopic or has a nearsighted prescription, there's a one in three chance. And even if both parents are not myop myopic, there's still a one in four chance that that, that child develops myopia. The next factor is lifestyle factors. Right now, this is playing a very significant role in changes that we're seeing today, not just the genetic piece of things, but now the lifestyle factors that are playing a significant role. That first part is insufficient time outdoors. So the less time that kiddos and adults are outdoors and exploring in that open space, we're transitioning to spending more time in increased near work, computer, tablets, reading, video games. And those are, again, factors playing a role into the development of myopia, as well as time spent in poor lighting conditions. So looking at that insufficient time outdoors, um, there's a lot of different studies that are showing how much kiddos are spending time outdoors right now versus in the past. And um, on an average, American children are spending about four to seven minutes a day in unstructured play outdoors. Some of them go up to about 30 minutes or some of those studies. Um, but even so, if you look at the reverse end of things, um, those same average American children are spending over seven hours a day on a screen, therefore progressing myopia, as well as a lot of other things. So I wanna take a little bit of a detour here and talk about not just the benefits of outdoor time for the reduction of myopia, but also the benefits beyond that. So outdoor play and creative play, again, promotes creativity, imagination, teaches responsibility, stimulates us in a different way than an on-screen video game would, gets your kiddo moving, improves fitness and gross motor skills, builds confidence and reduces stress and fatigue. So there's benefits beyond just myopia control. A few stats that, again, it's just important to acknowledge. Um, what is being shown with this change in our lifestyle of spending more time indoors and on devices. Um, and the big bolded area I think is the most important piece on this. The more time preschool children spend with screens equals less time spent engaged in creative play. And creative play is that foundation for learning, problem solving and creativity. As well as on that flip side, again, spending more time on the computer can lead to childhood obesity sleep disturbances, and difficulty uh, maintaining attention. So with that, that's another added benefit, again, beyond just myopia control. So what can we do to help prevent that or to allow for the chance for more interactive play outdoors and reducing the screen time? So these are a few tips and tricks that we utilize and we speak a lot about in the exam room as well when we're talking to kiddos that might be on the route to um, develop myopia as well as some other um, eye teaming and eye tracking concerns. And the first one here is turning, turning off devices about one to two hours before bedtime. The 2020 rule, which was developed by the American Optometric Association, and that's for every 20 minutes of near work, take a 20 second break to look at something 20 feet away as well as um, designated media-free times, as well as media-free locations in the home. And that's a recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And in combination of the um, American Optometric Association and the American Pediatrics Association for here, this is just a little bit of tidbit of information of what we should be looking at and how much time um, developing child should be on digital devices. And I really just wanted this here as a resource for you guys to compare to later um, and use um, as you need. But again, looking at the quality of how much time we're spending on it versus how much on devices versus how much time we're spending out in space, playing on playgrounds, things of that sort. Um, the ratio is pretty significant and that has been a huge shift, which is also leading to this myopia shift as well. So big question here, is the prevalence of myopia increasing? And the unfortunate answer to that is yes. Myopia is impacting more of the population today than it ever has before. So in the 1970s, about 25% of the population had um, myopia. As we moved here to the 2000s, about 42% of people have a nearsighted prescription. And it's predicted that by the year 2050, that 58% of the population will have myopia. So who's at risk for myopia? When should we be deciding or thinking about, does my child need a myopic um, management program? And this has a lot of information, but it summarizes it pretty well. 
So patients that are in the low risk category are patients that come in with a hyperopic prescription of greater than plus 0.75. And a hyperopic prescription is the opposite. It's far-sighted vision. And that's for any child that's um, six or younger. So they are considered in that low risk range for developing myopia. However, the recommendations are still that we limit time spent um, doing close work outside of school, as well as encouraging at least two hours of play outdoors. Kiddos that fall on that medium risk are patients that um, are six years and younger that have equal to or less than 0 0.075 diopters of hyperopia. So looking here, that could be a child that comes in younger than six that has theoretically no prescription. And that you would think is something that wouldn't be nerve wracking. We're looking good. But even at younger than six, if we come in with that measurement of no prescription, we still are in that medium risk range. And now what the recommendation is beyond those two that were made for the low risk assessment patients is also to monitor more closely, especially for shifts in a short period of time and shifts in that prescription. And then moving to the high risk um, kiddos are the ones that have confirmed myopia by school aged. Um, so typically by eight, but even before that, if they've got confirmed any amount of myopia, um, myopic prescription or nearsighted, this is when we should be considering enrolling them into a myopic management program. So after all that, we now know that it's increasing. We know that um, one of the side effects is bigger, thicker glasses or an increase in contacts each time or always changing and progressing. But what's the true implications of that other than the thicker and thicker glasses? There are long-term implications of having a myopic prescription, especially when that continues to progress. Unmanaged myopia can contribute to severe, significant, life-threatening conditions later on in life. Things like retinal detachment, myopic my maculopathy, glaucoma, and cataracts. So for retinal detachment, we're anywhere between three to 20 times more likely with a higher minus prescription. Glaucoma, two to three times more likely, and cataracts are occurring sooner in myopic patients. Now, another way to look at that is what studies are showing is that with um, the likelihood of retinal detachments with each diopter, so remember we talked that's the measurement of how we um, measure a prescription, with each diopter increase of a myopic prescription, there's a 30% increased risk of developing or having the occurrence of a retinal detachment. For a myopic maculopathy, each diopter increases the risk by 67%. For glaucoma, that risk increases by 20% and cataracts also increases by 20%. So again, having a myopic prescriptions put us at a higher risk for experiencing these um, sight-threatening conditions. So therefore, what would the benefits of beginning a myopic management program be or myopia management program? So based on these studies that with each diopter less of myopia, we reduce that visual impairment concern by 20%. So we decrease the risk um, of myopic maculopathy by 40%, glaucoma by 20%, visual impairment overall by 20%, and that's just with one diopter less of um, a myopic prescription. Also in theory, with a decrease of prescription of one diopter, we save a um, six months to a year of experiencing visual impairment. So we're delaying the occurrence of that. So overall, the benefits of being in a myopia management program is long-term. It's not just in the short term of now we're getting in a, in a wonderful prescription and the kiddo um, is seeing very well at this day or today at this time, but we're also impacting the long-term effects of myopia. We're slowing the worsening the nearsightedness, so we're not increasing that size of the prescription, not getting thicker and thicker glasses each year. We're reducing the elongation or the growth or the size of the eyeball itself. And therefore we're reducing the risk of myopic health complications down the road. So now what I'm gonna do is hand it over to Dr. Amy and she's gonna review the myopia management programs that we perform or we practice here at Hellerstein and Brenner. Great, thank you, Alex. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us tonight. I have the pleasure of talking about what we can do, how we can treat myopia and how we can slow down progression. 
So this is really exciting for us. You know, oftentimes we think about coming to the optometrist for our annual eye exams. We're getting new glasses. We're getting new contact lenses. Um, but I know myself and the other doctors, doctors that I have the privilege of practicing with, we take that a step further. We also have the responsibility to bring you the latest technology, to bring you treatment options, to help slow progression of nearsightedness and not just correcting with glasses and contacts. So there's some exciting things we can't wait to share with you. Um, the first one being what you might think of as traditional correction. So what I'm talking about is a pair of glasses, but not just correcting for distance vision. This is a bifocal pair of lenses, or if you're somebody that needs a little help up close, you might be familiar with a, a bifocal or a progressive design lens, which would be a no line bifocal. You might be surprised to learn that we actually fit bifocals um, for children. So it's not that these patients are unable to see clearly up close. In fact, nearsighted patients often see very well up close. They can even remove their glasses and, and read right up here, right up close. Um, but the bifocal design is in place to help reduce eye strain up close. And the thought process there is by reducing some of the strain and helping visual focus at near that we can slow down the rate of progression for these nearsighted patients. So the the benefits or the advantages of a treatment like this, um, it's a great option for children that might be too young for a contact lens, um, a patient that might be wary of using an eye drop, which we'll get into in the next bit. Um, so it's great for younger patients that may have a fear of or maybe just not ready for contacts or eye drops. It also gives some flexibility with prescription. So we've talked a lot about nearsightedness. We haven't touched too much on astigmatism and astigmatism really refers to, um, as Dr. Alex said, light not focusing on the back of the eye properly, but astigmatism creates blur and distortion. And so we might have a prescription that corrects for nearsightedness, but also we need to correct for astigmatism, which has more to do with the corneal shape. And in contact lenses, we sometimes are not able to meet those parameters or those demands for prescription. So being in a pair of glasses may allow us to correct for both the nearsighted portion and the astigmatism. The disadvantages to a treatment like this are that while they do help slow the progression of nearsightedness over time, they may not be as effective or as strong of a treatment as some of the others that we'll get into next, that the contacts and eye drop option. So with bifocal or progressive design glasses, we've been able to lower the progression of nearsightedness by about 20%. Um, the exciting news on the horizon, and I don't have a, a ton of information to share because this just came out um, early 2021, um, but just overall, we're recognizing that myopia or nearsightedness is increasing at a very rapid rate. And again, by year 2050, we anticipate 58% of the population will be impacted, which means there's a spotlight on nearsighted progression. So more research dollars, more companies collaborating for better technology. So just um, this year, both a contact lens company and a glasses company, um, Essilor and Cooper Vision have teamed our united forces and they're trying to develop a pair of glasses for nearsighted progression, different than a bifocal or progressive lens. Um, this group is called Sight Glass, and they're using this diffusion optics technology to try to create a better option for patients that may not be able to wear contacts or use eye drops. So that's something um, that we should hear more about in the coming year. So we're going to talk a little bit about atropine. Um, I can't see many of you on your cameras, but I think you would all um, nod that maybe you know what dilating drops are. Maybe you've had them at your exams with us or elsewhere. So believe it or not, there's a way to use a dilation drop at a very low concentration to help slow the progression of nearsightedness. So this drop is called atropine and it's used at a very low concentration so that the patients won't experience the same side effects or to the same degree that you do in your annual exam. So, you know, with a dilation drop, you may notice increased light sensitivity and things are blurry up close after your eye exam, and that can last for about three to four hours. So instead of using something like 1% atropine, which might be more appropriate at an eye exam, 
this is 0.01% atropine. And the treatment protocol is one drop of the atropine is used in the evening at bedtime, one drop in each eye before bed. And then during the day, this patient would wear their typical correction, which could be glasses or contacts. So the advantages of a treatment like this would be that it does not require the use, again, of contact lenses. So it might be better suited for younger patients that aren't comfortable wearing contacts. Um, we're not limited, again, by amount of prescription. So some of our patients with higher nearsightedness or, again, higher astigmatism that can't be corrected with a contact lens, this could be an option. And it can be used in combination with other treatment plans. So it could be used along with a bifocal pair of glasses and the use of atropine. It could be used with a multifocal contact and the use of atropine, which may have an even more effective um, way to slow the rate of progression. Some of the disadvantages include that this medication is not, I mean, you can't go to Walgreens or CVS and just pick this up. It's actually a compounded drop. Um, so sometimes it may have a higher cost. You have to use eye drops nightly with good routine and good practice. So some children um, and even teenagers really just don't like the idea of eye drops. So it's something we have to get comfortable with and be motivated to use. And some of the other disadvantages like light sensitivity and that defocus we talked about up close that you would get with traditional dilating drops now has improved that they found kind of the perfect concentration of lowering side effects, but still being effective for this sort of treatment. So that's one option. Orthokeratology lenses are a hard contact lens that's custom designed to fit, excuse me, custom designed to fit the cornea. So you can think about this lens as almost like a retainer or a mold. So thinking of the front of the eye and that hard lens is going there and kind of reshaping the cornea overnight. So this is something worn while these children are asleep. Um, the treatment requires at least eight hours of lens wear to be effective. Um, so we need to be in a really good habit and routine of wearing these lenses in the evening. The advantage is pretty clear that we're free of glasses and contact lenses through the day. Um, so this is great for athletics, great for water sports in particular. I worked with a, a young girl who was on her diving team, and so she couldn't wear glasses, of course, in the pool. And her contact lenses with the pressure with diving often would kind of move around or rotate. So orthokeratology lenses or ortho-K lenses were a great option for her. Some of the disadvantages here would be that we are limited by prescription. So Ortho-K lenses are best for patients with a prescription of nearsightedness lower than a minus six and astigmatism at 1.75 or lower. So we are a little limited in those parameters, but for those it works for, it's a great option. Um, it can lower that myopic progression by about 50%. Some of the other disadvantages are if we don't have a good routine, so we can't get full lens wear for eight hours. You know, I think about my high school and college age students that don't have always the best routine and sleeping that full eight hours. You may have a rebound. So by the end of the day, there might be a little fluctuation in vision. So some patients have a pair of, you know, glasses they can wear at night to sharpen their acuity if the corneal shape has kind of gone back to that more neutral position. And then there's another option with contact lenses. These are lenses worn during the day, the soft multifocal contact lens. So initially, bifocal contacts were really designed with adults in mind, trying to create a contact lens that would correct both distance vision and correct for reading vision without having to reach for reading glasses every time you have to look at something up close. So these bifocal contact lenses were, again, designed for that purpose, but through research, they've noted that children wearing these multifocal or bifocal contacts showed a slow in the progression of nearsightedness as well. So this could be a nice alternative treatment for them too. So the advantages here, you know, freedom from glasses, not needing to wear glasses throughout the day. I put in a little uh, star here to say that really all contact lens wear should have a pair of backup glasses for days where they don't feel like wearing their lenses or if they have a red itchy eye and shouldn't be in their contacts. So just remember that. Um, 
it's more effective in controlling progression than just a single vision contact alone, you know, just a contact that would correct their distance vision. And it's great for sports and athletics, you know, better peripheral vision. We don't have, you know, the glasses creating um, peripheral distortion or being caught up by the frame. Some of the disadvantages of a soft bifocal or multifocal contact would include, you know, they are at a greater expense. They're a little bit more expensive than just a distance only contact because the design itself is more complex. Um, we do have some limited treatment for patients that have astigmatism. And so we won't be able to best correct that with just a soft lens alone. And previously there, again, because these lenses were designed for and created for adults needing a bifocal, we didn't have a ton of options. The design was really important. So for children that were using this sort of design, it's really important that the lens has the center of the lens dedicated for distance vision, and then the outer areas dedicated for reading. Now for many of the lenses, it's the opposite. So if they have a near center and then the periphery is for distance, it doesn't work for myopia control. So we were limited in our lens options. And a lot of those options that would work were a monthly disposable lens. And for new wearers and for kiddos, we really want to, you know, hygiene is highly important with contact lens where we want to reduce the risk for infection and keratitis. So we have been waiting for and looking for a daily disposable lens that is really designed for nearsighted control. And really the purpose of our talk is to introduce it. So it's really exciting. It's called the MySight Lens and our whole treatment program is the Brilliant Futures Myopia Management Program. Um, so just this year, they've launched, this is for a Cooper Vision product, they've launched their new lens, the MySight One Day Contact Lens. So it's single use, so reducing the risk for infection. Um, it is FDA approved to slow the progression of myopia in children. And the studies that they've done, they've done both a three and five year study um, on children starting to wear the lens between ages eight and 12 years old. And so we'll talk a little bit about the lens design and how that works. So when I mentioned the bifocal or multifocal contact, we talked about it's so important that the distance portion or the center portion of that lens is for distance. So in this little um, picture here, you can see the ring design, the light purple area corrects for distance vision so that patients are seeing clear, sharp at distance. The dark purple rings represent the treatment zones for this area of myopic defocus to start training the eye to slow the lengthening or axial length and to slow progression. Thanks, Dr. Alex. Dr. Alex is a whiz with my slides, with her slides. Um, so who's a good candidate? So prime candidates would be patients between ages 8 and 12 to start wearing this lens, that their prescription be between 0.75 and minus 4, and with less than or equal to 0.75 of astigmatism. And so that's the parameters. Now, the lenses do have higher powers than up to that minus 4. So it's not to say that other patients wouldn't be candidates for this lens, but this is what the study um, focused on. And so it's just really exciting to see what sort of results they got from this study. And I may pass it over to Dr. Wiss to share some of the data with you here. It's pretty cool. So this is just a snippet of um, the three-year clinical study, the results um, in two different graphs here. Um, the first one displaying that with wearing a MySight one-day lens for three years versus um, a comparable one on the market, um, again, another one-day lens, not with that myopic um, or myopia progression reduction, but with a just single vision distance lens, is that over those three-year time frame or over that three-year time frame is that the MySight one-day lens reduced myopic prescription by 59%. So the kiddos in the study that were in the one day of a different brand and just single vision they progress at a much greater weight, at a rate of 59% higher. And then the other piece of that study showed that, again, the same thing over a three-year period, kiddos wearing the MySight lens versus a single vision distance contact lens, their 
length or axial length of the elongation of the eyeball was reduced by 52%. So some amazing results as um, we were talking about earlier, Dr. Amy was talking about earlier about, um, you know, atropine versus a bifocal lens versus those that were under that 50% mark, under 20% on some of those. Here's an option that shows us 59% in one category and 52 in another, which is a pretty amazing result. And then again, like Dr. Amy mentioned, it wasn't just this three year, but they also did a five year and they're continuing forward. Um, so it's amazing to see how much goes into this technology and the proof behind that technology as well. And then the last little bit here, um, we did compare different goods and bads of um, other treatment options for myopia progression. And for the MySite, again, with these studies, um, they looked into what things are beneficial, what things are maybe questionable, and what do they want to do about those. Um, but what's really amazing to see is within those studies, they surveyed the parents and the children that were in MySite to see how they were at things like handle um, ease of handle for children, as well as ability to focus on other things that matter like schoolwork. And so of that, 90% of the children preferred their MySite contact lenses compared to glasses. 90% of them could insert and remove um, the contact lenses on their own. And again, this was studied around eight to 12 years of age. So they were all able to, 90% uh, of them were able to do it on their own. Um, parents, 90% of the parents surveyed noted that their children were happier. And the list of what, hap um, of what happier included was comfort, vision, ease of use, freedom from glasses. And then the ability to focus on the things that matter, nine out of 10 reported seeing well during schoolwork, seeing well during outdoor activities and saw well during computer and video games. So all things that are really important to kiddos and the adults with schoolwork. And so again, telling not only is this something that's showing 59% um, reduction in myopic progression, as well as 52% reduction in that elongation of the eyeball, but also the kids and the parents are very happy with the contact lens wear itself. So looking after all of that, we've gone over what myopia is, um, why it's important to know what myopia is, things that we can do pre to prevent it, the implications of myopia, different myopic um, or myopia management programs. Now we're really looking at who's a candidate, when should we be considering this for your child? Um, and here's a list of questions that if you answer yes to or young to for some of these, it should be something that we're considering. It should be something that we think about is, is myopia, myopia management program something that would benefit your kid, not only today, but something in the future as well. So things like how old is your child? How old is your child when they first were diagnosed with nearsightedness? So is your child already diagnosed with myopia at a younger age? How many parents of that child are nearsighted? How many hours per day does your child spend outdoors versus how many hours a day does your child spend doing close work? And if any of those markers go into, you know, two parents, they're both nearsighted. They spend less than 30 minutes outdoors. They spend more than two hours on the computer. They were diagnosed with myopia at age six. Those are all things that are should be a little lights going, hey, we need to look into this myopia management program options for our child. So that really summarizes what we have to present today. So again, we just wanna thank you for attending and taking your time out of your Tuesday evening to talk with us and learn about myopia management. Um, we do have more events coming up as well as um, you can reach us at our emails if you have any questions beyond that that you'd like to ask. Um, for future talks, we, our next one is in March. It's March 16th on concussion, how vision is impacted. And then we'll also have one coming up in April on sports vision training. We've talked a lot about a lot of different areas when it comes to myopia management. Here's a list of some of our resources. If you are interested in learning more or seeing more of the amazing results of the Brilliant Futures Myopia Management Program, the studies behind that, please reach out. I'm more than happy to send those to you. And then with that, does anyone have any questions for us? Or Dr. Grell, did anyone mention any questions to you? No, we didn't have any questions. You and Dr. Amy did such a good job. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, we do have a question. Are there any efforts toward creating programs in schools to counteract eye strain? 
Great question. I am not aware of any programs. I know when teachers come in or parents come in, um, we do spend a good chunk of that exam, or Dr. Amy and I and Dr. Grau spend a lot of that exam talking about different habits that can help improve and reduce the eye strain in the sense of the 2020 rule and um, options of printed material versus on the computer, limiting screen time, as well as encouraging that outdoor play. Um, I have not heard of any programs yet. I don't know if anyone else has, but that would be an awesome idea. Okay, thank you. We have another question. Um, my site versus ortho K, which one is more effective in slowing down progression? So that's a great question. They haven't really done, to my knowledge, a comparative study because, again, my site is so new. But most of the studies that talk about the efficacy of OrthoK lenses, and again, that's the one that is worn overnight to help mold and reshape the front of the eye, it's about 50%. Um, so I would say OrthoK and my site are fairly comparable in their efficacy. And again, they have different advantages and disadvantages. One being with ortho -K, that this is not a lens that has to be worn during the day. So freedom from glasses and contacts during the day. Um, but again, we have to look at um, parameters. So the, the strength of the prescription and the amount of astigmatism may be a limiting factor on those. But ortho -K and my site, to my knowledge, are fairly equal um, in efficacy. I would agree with that. I think right now my site um, being newer has done a lot of research and a lot of studies showing their um, effect. And just from all of that, it's it's hard to deny the awesomeness that is my site. But again, OrthoK has shown wonderful results over time um, and around that 50% effect. We have another great question. Doesn't the distance of where you hold your material play a role in myopia? For example, reading material, kids on their tablets, phones, et cetera. Yes, it does. Um, there's a great little rule that I often um, will suggest in the exam room in addition to the 2020-20 rule. So those visual breaks that can be used for reading and screen time and phones. If we're holding a device close, close, the closer something is, the more accommodative focus, or think about like a camera lens having to zoom in and zoom out. So that extra effort to make things clear up close. So the closer it is, the greater the effort. Um, we still need to have things within a, a near space that we can see them. So often the rule that's recommended is the Harman rule or the Harman distance. So if you take your fist like this and put it to your chin, <laughs> Dr. Alex is doing it too, <laughs> the reading material should not come closer than your elbow. So that's a good rule of thumb and a way that you can remind your, yourself um, to not get your device right up to your eyes, um, but a good measuring tool for kiddos. So there should be a relaxed, you know, kind of bend in their elbow and we're not holding things that close. So you could try to practice the, the Herman distance. And if either of you have any other tricks you can add to it. Thank you. Any last questions from, I don't think so. Nothing coming through, so I think you guys did great. <laughs> and again, we wanna thank everybody for joining us, taking time out of their evenings. Um, that, that about wraps it up, I think. Anything to add? Dr. Amy, the, last thing, the last thing I was gonna add is please at your annual visits or your children's annual visits, ask us about these options. Um, we have a lot of literature and handouts that we're more than happy to share, talk to you about the options. And, you know, not every option is great for each patient. So if you have more specific questions about yourself or your child, you can reach out again, Dr. Alex and my um, emails are back there on the slides if you have more specific questions. And, um, you know, we really just appreciate your attendance. So thank you. Thank you, okay. everyone. Enjoy your evening. <laughs>